what is up y'all welcome back to my channel serendipity today i'm going to be reacting to why 95 percent of australia is empty last video i did gave a little uh insight to this one um but basically it's just a lot of it is the outback it's the desert it gets the temperatures are like, like get as much or close to as much as the sahara desert so yeah <laughs> the terrain some of the terrain probably not with it being hot and in the desert it's not feasible to live in so yeah that's my pick <laughs> i mean let's let's see let's see what he's gonna be talking about be the smallest but it's also the only one to be entirely controlled by just a single country Almost everybody knows, though, that while Australia is a huge place in terms of land, it's also a pretty small place in terms of population. But few people really understand the absolute scale of how sparsely populated the Australian continent actually is. To help put the numbers into some perspective, Australia is of a comparable size to the lower 48 US states. These 48 US states have a population of more than 300 million wow. people, while Australia only has a population of a little crazy, more than 20. Because I didn't realize Australia was, the, I knew it was pretty much the size of the US. I just never realized it literally takes up pretty much all of the US. I didn't really actually realize that. Six million. This means that there are two American states that have more people than the entirety of the Australian continent. California with more than 39 million Probably and Texas, Texas with more yeah. than 28 million. For a more European perspective, the population of only England, without factoring in any of the rest of the UK, is more than double the entire population of Australia. Despite being an entire continent, there are actually seven significantly smaller islands across the world that have higher populations than Australia. Great Britain, of course, along with Honshu, Luzon, Mindanao, Java, Sumatra, and Madagascar. Java alone has nearly six times Australia's tiny population, Jeez. despite being an island that is 60 times smaller than Australia, the continent. But it still gets even Java crazier because there's also a bunch of cities across the world that right now have more people than the entire continent as well. The Tokyo, Jakarta, and Delhi metropolitan areas all have greater populations than the entirety of Australia, while the Shanghai and Seoul metro areas have roughly similar populations. Sao Paulo, Mexico City, New York City, Cairo, Lagos, Mumbai, and Moscow all have largely comparable metropolitan populations to Australia as well. And all things considered, Australia really only has five actual major cities across their continent. Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth, and Adelaide, which collectively account for the residences of nearly two out of every three Australians. Australia is therefore among the most heavily urbanized nations in the world with the overwhelming majority of the population, around 90%, concentrated into relatively small urban areas that only account for 0.22% of Australia's total land area, with half of the overall population living within just these red areas, wow. and the other half almost entirely living in these blue <laughs> That areas. is actually overall, wild. Overall, around 85% of all Australians live within just 50 kilometers of the coastline meaning that there's hardly anyone deeper into the continent's vast interior. This unique population distribution creates a lot of fascinatingly bizarre situations across the continent. For example, this is the Shire of East Pilpara in Western Australia. It is roughly the same size as Japan, but there's only a bit more than 10,000 people who live here, and half of them wow. just live right here in the town of Newman. It's basically just a small town, 4, but with the space of Japan. Then, perhaps even more strangely, there's the pastoral unincorporated area down here. That's actually pretty crazy. Because we, we, in the town I have, that I live in is like 4,000. But if you talk about like our parish, like our county, there's way more than that. In South Australia, 
This dot is the city of Adelaide, Australia's fifth largest city home to more than 1.3 million people. And immediately adjacent to this oasis of urban life is the pastoral unincorporated area, a territory that's roughly the size of France, but is only home to a whopping 3,750 oh people, making the population density something like 178 square kilometers of land for every one person. That is roughly one Aruba's worth of land for every single resident inside of the pastoral. So, like, what is like the jobs there? Like, what do most people go like from here? Well, Louisiana is a very um, like a industrial, like it's big industrial place. So, a lot of people want to become boilermakers because that's where like all the money is. But anyway, other than that, you would like or like welding or farming really is like the biggest jobs here um i wonder what like is it like farming that you go to that you naturally go to or like what's the most what's the job that you do there incorporated air oh yeah. Then there's also Anna Creek right over here. This is a huge territory that's slightly larger than Israel, and yet it isn't a country or even a governmental entity at all. No, Anna Creek is actually just a privately owned cattle ranch, the largest cattle ranch found anywhere in the world by far that is only staffed by eight full-time employees according to Wikipedia. So this entire area that's the size of Israel is usually only home to less than a dozen people and around 10,000 wow. cows. Australia is really, really, really empty. And to hammer yeah. the point home even further, consider the towns of Esperance on the south coast and Kununurra near to the north coast. Both of these towns are within the same state of Western Australia, and it takes at least 35 hours of time to drive from one to the other across a distance of more than 3,200 kilometers. And along that entire distance and time, you'll maybe only drive through a population of less than 70,000 people People the entire way. For comparison, Jeez. this drive would be about the same. So that drive literally, like going down the road, you, you just probably like see nothing the whole time you're going. That's Time wild. and distance is driving from Madrid to Istanbul across nearly the whole of Europe where there would be a lot more than 70,000 people. Yeah. So what is it about Australia that makes it such an overall empty void of people? What is it about this continent that has made everything I just brought up possible? Well, the easy answer that I'm sure most of you were thinking right now is the desert. Duh. Everybody knows that Australia is covered in a big old desert with tons of super dangerous animals and insects. Yes. Who would ever want to actually live spiders. in most of the country? And while there is Oof. some truth to this line of thinking, I am here to argue with you that that's only a small part of the overall population puzzle in Australia. And the full explanation for why there are so few people on this continent is overall a pretty complicated one. Most of the problem stems from the fact that Australia is pretty uniquely cursed when it comes to both the geologic and location perspective. Located relatively close by to Antarctica, the frozen continent, the western side of Australia is continuously battered by cold ocean currents coming up from the southern ocean, which means that there simply isn't enough heat to generate large-scale evaporation that's necessary to form rain clouds over much of the west. Meanwhile, in the oh. east, the Great Dividing Range is Australia's largest and longest chain of mountains, and the fifth longest anywhere in the world. These mountains run down the entire eastern side of the continent from north to south, and their height denies many rain clouds advancing from the Pacific the ability to move any further into Australia than the immediate and narrow band of land between the mountains and the coastline. Thus, a so-called that makes sense. I wondered why, like, it's not like there is like it's not like Australia is just flat. I would kind of understand, but it's like you got these like nice, you know, rainforesty areas. You got this mountain. You got all these different landscapes. How do you just get a big old desert in the middle, like, or well, western to the middle? 
Now I get it, that makes sense. That makes sense. Rain shadow is cast by these mountains across the vastness of the Australian interior to the west, where moisture coming in from the east understandably struggles to penetrate into. But yeah. these mountains, generally speaking from a global perspective, aren't really all that impressive. Truly big mountains cannot be found anywhere on the surface of Australia, and overall, the continent has the lowest average elevation of all of Earth's continents, which yeah. just creates a further huge problem for rainfall. The tallest mountain and highest point that can be found anywhere in mainland Australia is here within the Great Dividing Range, Mount Kosciuszko. Know, but it's tall. only 2,228 hmm. meters high above sea level. For comparison, the highest point of every single other inhabited continent is at least more than double that height, and nearly three quarters of the entire U.S. state of Colorado alone maintains an elevation that is significant. Yeah, I didn't know how real elevation sickness is like you always hear about it i went to denver in may and i got sick i like even though the plane ride there uh we was like maybe 30 minutes and i just started feeling sick and then we were like driving around there was no parking spots in denver and i'm like i told my friend i was like look we're about to come to this red light i need you to hop out the car and run into the store to get like a uh, Dramamine and some like ibuprofen. Oh, it was, I was so sick. I was so sick. Significantly higher than just that one sort of tall mountain in Australia. Cause like Denver itself is not high. Now that's why I realized when people were like, yeah, don't go to the Rocky Mountain your first, um, like wait to climb up the mountains. Um, because like your body get used to the elevation. Oh, that was so bad. But, this yeah. means that there are simply very few tall mountains to be found anywhere on the continent that are actually capable of forcing air upwards where it's possible to cool into rain. And then, to make matters even worse, that air is very often just too hot for rain to form anyway because mm. the continent straddles the boundary of the Tropic of Capricorn, placing a significant amount of northern Australia to be well within the tropics and almost the rest of the continent down in the subtropic. This area of the wow. world is dominated by the subtropical high pressure belt that wraps around the entire globe and it simultaneously serves to both warm and dry the air around it. So whatever air even does get pushed up by the few tall mountains in Australia has to also contend with this phenomenon. And what's even more, Australia has to also contend with the difficult to predict oscillations of the Southern Pacific Ocean known as El Nino and La Nina. During an El Nino event, which can sometimes last for years at a time, the Southern Pacific often goes through prolonged periods of slower than usual wow. westerly winds. And that naturally means that there will be less atmospheric moisture delivered by those winds to the eastern and northern parts of the Australian continent, often accompanied by exacerbated drought-like conditions. It's unsurprising then that many of the worst bushfires in Australia's history have taken place at the exact same time as during one of these El Nino events. All of these factors converge to make Australia by far the driest inhabited continent on the Earth, with the least amount of average annual rainfall and, consequently, That's desert wild. or desert-like conditions understandably exist over about 35% of the continent's total area. I mean, just take a look at this- I don't this. know, to go for a drought for years? That's- Crazy. <laughs> map of Australia's average rates of annual rainfall, where you can see most of the rain on the continent falls on the east coast in the stretch of land between the coastline and the Great Dividing Range, in the north that stretches into the tropics, Tasmania in the south, and around Perth in the southwest corner. It's basically an identical map with Australia's current population density pattern, except in one very interesting and notable area, Northern Australia. The problem up here is not that it receives a low amount of rain on average, but that it receives that rain largely all at once and over ridiculously variable periods of time. Just like everywhere else in the tropics, northern Australia is dominated by the wet and the dry season, where rainfall is greater during the summer and less during the winter. In the case of Darwin, the largest city up here on Australia's northern coast, the average annual rainfall amount is more than 1,800 millimeters, which is nearly triple the amount of rainfall that London gets. 
However, wow. the vast majority of that rain falls during just the four months of the wet season, between December and March, when the area's monsoons and tropical cyclones are generally active. Mm -hmm. And when you discount the immediate coastline, the rest of northern Australia in the interior, between the coast in the north and the Tropic of Capricorn in the south, suffers from some of the most highly erratic rainfall seen anywhere on the planet largely owing to the unpredictable pattern of the area's tropical cyclones. Back in 1898, one of these cyclones dumped an absolutely unbelievable 740 millimeters of rain over this small northern Australian town in just a single day, more than the entire wow. average annual rainfall of London which could give the false impression if you just looked at that single year of more rainfall here than in the UK. But then, a few decades later on in 1924, without any cyclones penetrating through to the interior here, this town only received four millimeters of rain throughout the whole year, which is Man, even less than the like yearly the average of the or... Sahara Desert. But it's not just wow. the erratic nature of the continent's rainfall that makes fresh water a scarcity here. It's also the lack It's of... like literally you either too much or too less. Like there's no in between. Any decently large rivers. The most significant river system on the continent is the Murray-Darling Basin here in the southeast in one of Australia's most heavily populated cores. But it just kind of sucks from a build a big civilization perspective. First of all, the waters of the system flow southwestward and empty out right here on the south coast. This isn't really good because as mentioned previously, most of this basin exists in the part of Australia beyond the Great Dividing Range that doesn't usually see a lot of rainfall to replenish the rivers with water. As a result, the average annual flow of the waters in the basin amounts to just 24,000 gigaliters a year which is the lowest rate of flow of any of the world's greatest river systems. For comparison, wow. the Mississippi Basin in the United States has an average annual flow of nearly 530,000 gigaliters a year, which is more than 22 times the flow of water that Australia's greatest river system has got. Nonetheless, it's the best that the continent has got, and the basin provides the drinking water for around 3 million Australians today. While the area around it has developed into the agricultural heartland of the modern Australian nation, providing nearly the entirety of the food that the 26 million people of Australia consume, along with enough to export to millions more across Asia. But as climate change continues to worsen the effects of drought on the continent, the waters that feed this agricultural heartland through the Murray-Darling Basin are getting harder and harder to come by with every passing decade. Nine of the 10 hottest recorded years in the continent's history have taken place just since 2005. These higher temperatures are rapidly increasing the rates of evaporation throughout the waters of the basin. And with already limited rainfall throughout the majority of it, it's making the water here increasingly scarce. With some sections of the basin at times remaining completely dry for months on end. And it's not just the scarcity of fresh water on the continent that makes sustaining a very large population difficult. It's also the scarcity of good land for farming and agriculture, mm -hmm. owing once again largely to geography, geology, and location. In northern Australia, there hasn't been any new mountain buildings since the pre-Cambrian era that ended one and a half billion years ago. And even further, there hasn't been any glacial activity here since the Carboniferous ended nearly 300 million years ago. Uh. Thus, this entire region that covers nearly half of the continent has suffered its soils being beneath continuous weathering and erosion for well over 250 million years, compared to less than 10,000 years for most of the soils on other continents like North America, Europe, or Asia. Therefore, the soil nearly everywhere in northern Australia just sucks for agriculture. The only exception to that rule is the area of the river basin that drains here into Lake Erie. But this is an overall small amount of the north, and the rainfall required for irrigation here is still very low. But the thing is, none of these geographic or climatic explanations really give the full picture. Because despite everything that I just spent the last 10 minutes explaining to you, it turns out that Australia actually has a ton of freshwater resources. Well, 
at least when compared to countries and not to continents. In mm. fact, Australia has an estimated 492 cubic kilometers worth of renewable freshwater resources which is more than a lot of countries with significantly higher populations. That's twice as much as Pakistan, for example, a country which has more than eight times as many people. So it's not just a sheer lack of fresh water, and it's not just a sheer lack of arable land either. While, yeah, only about 6% of Australia's land is actually arable and suitable for agriculture, Australia is huge. So that 6% yeah. is still a ton of usable farmland. To put it in a context, Australia has more arable land than Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, the Philippines, Vietnam, That's Cambodia, wild. and Laos all have combined. Despite all of these countries having a combined population of 542 million people, and Australia only having 26 million people. To put it into <laughs> another perspective, Australia has by far the highest ratio in the entire world of arable land to population at around 1.9 arable hectares of land for every one citizen of the country. For the sake of comparison, the ratio in the United States is only about 0.47 arable hectares of land per one citizen. This means that if Australia ever reached the same ratio of arable land to people as the United States, the continent would be home to well over 90 million people, still substantially less than the population of America, but also substantially more people than Australia has today. In theory, Australia does have enough space and resources to support a lot more people than the 26 million who live there today. The big reason why it doesn't is because for pretty much the entire history of Australia, right up until the present day, it's just been a really tough place for anyone to actually get to. You see, yeah. for millions of years now, Australia has been effectively a lost continent, isolated from all the Earth's other major landmasses drifting alone out in the sea. This has resulted in millions of years of completely separate evolution for the animals of the continent, which is why Australia is unique among Earth's continents for the fact that marsupials and not placental mammals dominate the indigenous mammal wildlife species. Modern humans first reached the continent sometime around 50,000 years ago, when the area's geography looked radically different than it does today. Yeah. With sea Jeez. levels significantly lower back then, humans were able to simply walk down the Sunda Peninsula, hop across just a few islands, and then make it into present-day New Guinea, which back then was connected to Australia via a land bridge as the prehistoric continent of Sahul. And after these initial humans made it to the continent, they remained almost entirely undisturbed for tens of thousands of years by any other groups of humans from anywhere in the outside world. As sea levels began to rise following the end of the last ice age, Sahul was flooded and the land bridge between New Guinea and Australia fell beneath the waves around 10,000 years ago, making Australia even more remote than it had been previously, and even less likely to wow. ever be visited by outsiders. For the next 9,600 years before the eventual arrival of the Europeans in the 17th century, the Australian continent may have only been significantly visited and impacted by outside humans a total of just two times. Dingoes, an invasive species of dog likely originating from New Guinea, were introduced to Australia sometime around 8,300 years ago, potentially by an unknown group of human visitors coming from the island. About 11% of the modern Aboriginal Australian DNA also derives from from Indians, which suggests a potential encounter on the continent with a group of humans from South Asia sometime around 4,000 years ago. And then, after millennia of existing almost entirely undisturbed by the outside world, in 1606, a Dutchman and his crew suddenly showed up on their ships and landed right here on the western side of the Cape York Peninsula. But even after that, the Dutch never really bothered to ever establish any permanent settlements or presence on the continent because the parts of it that they found were generally decided to be too uninhabitable for all the reasons that I mentioned during the first half of this video. The closest the Dutch ever came to a permanent settlement on Australia happened entirely by accident. 50 years after their dis- Sorry I'm not talking, I just realized that I wasn't talking. I'm literally just into this video. I'm literally just watching it. I've learned so much stuff that I didn't know. <laughs> I just realized I haven't said anything in a while.
discovery in 1656, a Dutch ship called the Vergulde Dreieck crashed off the coast of Western Australia around here. 75 of the ship's survivors miraculously made it to the shore, and then seven of them were dispatched on one of the ship's lifeboats to make the 1,400-mile-long journey over to Batavia, or modern-day Jakarta, on the island of Java, which was the administrative capital of colonial Dutch rule in Indonesia at the time. After 41 grueling days of travel, these seven people finally made it to Batavia and raised the alarm for the 68 crew and passengers who they had left behind back in Australia. And for the next several years, numerous search and rescue missions were carried out by the Dutch Navy all along the Western Australian coast. But little sign of the ship's wreckage was ever discovered. And the 68 survivors of the Vergulde Dreieck who were left behind were simply never seen or heard from again. Their ultimate wow. fates remaining a mystery to this day. They simply vanished into the vast void of Australia and history without much of a trace. More than three centuries of time would pass before finally, in 1963, the wreckage of the Vergulde Dreieck was discovered by a team of Australian divers roughly 100 kilometers north of modern-day Perth. Well over a century that after the vanishing wild. of the Vergulde 68 on the continent, the British finally established the first- Can you imagine finding something like that? That, like, a mystery, and then, like, all these years later, finding it? That's crazy. Truly permanent European settlement on Australia, only in 1788, over on the complete other side of the continent, around modern-day Sydney, with around 1,300 people. At the time, the Aboriginal population of the continent was likely only somewhere around 650,000 which was pretty much the entire population of Australia as a whole. To put that into perspective, every other inhabited continent on the planet had vastly, vastly more people than that back in 1788. Asia already had more than 650 million people, Jeez. around a thousand times the population of Australia. While Europe had nearly 150 million, Africa had 85 million, and the Americas had around 20 million. Australia therefore began the modern era of industrialization from a far, far lower population base than any other of Earth's inhabited continents. And since population growth tends to be exponential, Australia has been lagging behind the rest for centuries. In 1788, the population of the freshly independent United States stood at around 4 million people. It would take Australia more than a century of history not until the year 1906 to finally surpass the population of the United States back in 1788. Really? By 1906, America's population was already pushing 90 million. For most of Australia's history, immigration came almost entirely from just a single source, the British Isles. Following the discovery of gold on the continent in 1851, a massive gold rush to Australia ensued that saw around 2% of the entire population of the British Isles emigrate to Australia throughout the decade of the 1850s and more than doubled the Australian population almost overnight. But Australia struggled to attract large numbers of immigrants from Europe afterwards because it was heavily competing for them with more attractive countries in the Americas like the United yeah. States, Canada, Brazil, and Argentina. Who were much way to closer to Europe geographically and were yeah. thus generally cheaper and quicker for Europeans to emigrate to. It didn't help yeah. that beginning in 1901, the Australian government enacted a policy that would artificially reduce their numbers of immigrants to the continent for decades. The racist White Australia Policy which restricted immigration to only people of white, European ancestry, and initially gave overwhelming preference to migrants coming specifically from Britain. As a result, the flow of immigrants to the continent remained only a trickle of people oh. for decades across the early 20th century, while at the same time, millions of immigrants were arriving in the United States every yeah. couple of years. The population of Australia even shrank during World War I, when nearly one in five of Australia's men were shipped off to fight the war in Europe. Around two and a half percent of Australia's entire male population of the time never made it back home from the trenches and beaches of Europe. 
by the eve of World War II, Australia was a small and overwhelmingly European nation of only around 7 million on the periphery of Asia. And many white Australians of the time were terrified of being demographically overwhelmed by the extremely more populous nations of Asia just to the north. By the time war came to the continent, Imperial Japan had more than 10 times Australia's population, at more than 73 million. And after That's the Japanese crazy. bombed the northern Australian city of Darwin in 1942, fears across the continent were rife that an imminent Japanese invasion was coming. And while the invasion never actually materialized, the Australian government nonetheless came to believe that they needed to increase their population to avoid the threat of another invasion scare like that again in the future. Before 1940. That's crazy. Because, like, what if that had never happened? Can you. Imagine how less of a population Australia possibly could have now. Like, if they didn't get scared <laughs> in World War Two, and, like, only, what, like, 80 or so years ago. That's wild. Five. Almost all the immigrants to Australia came from either Great Britain or Ireland. But after the war, Australia for the very first time began encouraging immigration from across the European continent. The policies restricting immigration largely only to Britons were gradually relaxed to be more inclusive of all Europeans and by the 1960s, 3 million mainland Europeans from places like the Baltic states, Poland, Italy, the Balkans, and Greece packed up their bags and headed to Australia to begin a brand- Ooh, jeez. I wonder- I wonder what, oh, what did I do? I think I muted it. Oh, um, that's crazy. Like up until, what was it, 1943, if Japan never would have bombed uh, Darwin, like their population could um, possibly still be like extremely low. That's kind of crazy. And the fact that I wonder what made people come to Australia since like he said, so many, immigrants were going to all the Americas I wonder what was like oh let's let's go see what Australia is like all the Polish and uh, Italians and all of them was like let's go see what Australia is like or I wonder what made them go from I mean they were I would think they were good where they were at what made them want to come to Australia scare like that again in the future before 1945, almost all the immigrants to Australia came from either Great Britain or Ireland. But after the war, Australia for the very first time began encouraging immigration from across the European continent. The policies restricting immigration largely only to Britons were gradually relaxed to be more inclusive of all Europeans and by the 1960s, 3 million mainland Europeans from places like the Baltic states, Poland, Italy, the Balkans, and Greece packed up their bags and headed to Australia to begin a brand new life, many of them being displaced refugees from the war. But the exclusion oh, of non-whites okay. as immigrants to the continent yeah, remained sense. largely in force for several more decades even after the war. It wasn't until 1973, nearly three decades after wow. the end of World War II, that the white Australia policy was finally overturned and race ceased being a factor ago. in the continent's immigration policy. Ever since, Australia has what? maintained an official policy of multiculturalism and has welcomed large-scale multi-ethnic immigration for decades from all across the world. And now, in the 21st century, the vast majority of new immigrants to the continent come from Asia and not from Europe especially from China and India. Today, yeah, Australia caps the new numbers of immigrants to the continent at less than 200,000 a year, which for a country of only 26 million is actually a pretty consistently high rate of immigration. As mm -hmm. of 2022, nearly one in three people on the Australian continent was born outside of it, which is by far the highest proportion of immigrants found in the population of any developed Western nation. Australia yeah. today is a proud nation of immigrants from all across the world and by 2050, the continent's population is projected to increase up to around 36 million. About the same as Canada today and largely through continued immigration. 
But the growth over the next two decades will not come without its challenges. The continent's ancient natural challenges like unpredictable rainfall, drying rivers, droughts, and vast arid wilderness, along with new challenges like the uncertain course of climate change, mean that Australia has an epic battle against its own environment ahead of it to continue increasing their population. But despite all the odds that are stacked up against them, the country is actually one of the world's most major agricultural producers and exporters. With more than 104 million sheep on the continent, there are four times as many sheep as humans, and consequently, Jeez. Australia is the world's second largest producer of sheep and wool, and the fifth largest producer of beef. In addition, Australia is the home of slightly more than half of all the world's certified organic farmland, and is a global oh, wow. leader in almond and lentils production. I'm sorry that I didn't really interact too much through this video. I was actually very, um, like, into this video. I loved it. I learned so much that I never knew. I always knew that Australia had, a, like, a very low population, but I never knew the reasons why. I didn't know whether 1973, you know, allowing all these immigrants to come in from anywhere, um... Like, they would still have a low population. If Japan didn't bomb Darwin, they would have even a less, uh, a lower population. Like, there's so much of that stuff that I absolutely love and I just never knew about it. That was such a good video. I learned so much. Oh, wow. I learned so much about Australia's history in 30 minutes. It kind of makes you think, like, I always think when stuff like this happens, like, there's this big change in you know this happened so we had to change it i was thinking about like what if that thing didn't happen if that makes sense like in this instance if world war ii or the bomb never happened i wonder what australia would be like today because they had to be at some point there had to be like you know we don't have enough as enough people and i wonder would they eventually just come to realization to let other people come in or would they still just be like, no, I don't care, even, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Oh, I loved it. I actually very enjoyed that video. I just can't keep on saying it. I mean, I can't stop saying it, but um, yeah, if you like more of these types of videos, um, let me know. And uh, that's, all I, that's all I got. I'm sorry that I didn't really interact too much. I was just so captivated in this video. But um, thank you for watching. And like always, there's more to come and I'll see you in the next one.